Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is John. As you know, I have a vested interest in teaching people to learn to code, also games, and also economics. An eclectic mix to be sure. Today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Dr. Cripps, um, who has studied uh, virtual economies, kind of touches on games, and also economics. And uh, we're from the same cohort at GMU. That's how we originally met. And I'm just going to dive right into the question. So the first question would be, can you give us a little of your own background? So would you mind reviewing kind of like pre-doctoral degree, um, your background in terms of education, industry maybe, and motivation for enrolling? Sure, yeah. Um, I grew up uh, kind of on the West Coast, you know, Utah, California. Uh, joined the Navy very young. Uh, I got an ROTC scholarship. They put me through my undergrad in computer science. Shared love of ours. Um, I uh, spent uh, eight years in the Navy. I got commissioned as an officer. I moved all around uh, Japan, Virginia. Uh, got stationed here in the D.C. area. I got out. Um, I, I work at uh, the federal agency that makes maps and charts. You know, that seemed like a smooth transition after I was like a navigator in the Navy. Um, uh, I, along the way, I got really interested. You know, there's all this national discussion about universal health care and, um, you know, uh, just national level issues. And I finally had time after getting out of the Navy to start looking into some of those things because I thought, you know, I want to be like a responsible, educated citizen. So I started reading economics books and listening to podcasts, and I just fell into the rabbit hole. I mean, it's just, uh, it's like Pete Betke says, right, the, the GMU professor, economics is like the golden key by which you can understand, you know, like why people do things and uh, what motivates human behavior, and, and I just it just grabbed me, and uh, I uh, I had to, I was finishing up a master's degree in system engineering at the time, so I had to finish that. But after I finished that, I enrolled, same cohort as you, as you pointed out at, G at GMU, and it took us both uh, you know six or seven years to get through it because we're both doing it part time. But uh, yeah, recently uh, my dissertation was approved. I'm now doctor, graduate next month, so here I am, very excited to be here. Thank you. Congratulations again. I know the feeling. It's fantastic. And I didn't, I, th I must have forgotten that you lived in Japan for a while. So very cool. Um, in this dissertation, like me, um, I think it's becoming a trend at GMU. Um, you take a three essays approach. So we're going to touch on all three essays. Um, I, would, I would ask just kind of like as an overview question, like how would you summarize these three? Is there kind of, usually there's like a theme across um, and so, how would you describe that theme, and how did you come to have an interest in that theme? So, I, you know, I have been a gamer, if you will, my whole life. I mean, you know, I remember when I was very young, like my dad brought home an Atari and then the Nintendo and, you know, just up the chain. And I'd stay up until all hours of the morning with my cousin playing, you know, whatever game we had at the time. Um, so, I, virtual stuff has always fascinated me. And, you know, in about the early 2000s, MMOs started taking off. And, and I, I just I thought it was very interesting and fascinating that, like, people were doing actual economic things in these environments. Um, they, they've, of course, exploded in the range of activities and possibilities that you can do uh, in them. But, I mean, people were selling uh, in-game equipment for real money and, you know, markets were forming and you know, you could put a dollar value on people's labor that they were, you know, I don't know, so it's just very interesting. Um, when I was in the pro, when I started the program at GMU, I, I, I was just sort of asking around for advice, you know, talking to some of the faculty about, I'm trying to decide what to write about, and uh, I, I eventually um, caught the ear of uh, Brian Kaplan, and I was just asking him his advice, and he said, you're a part-time student, okay, most part-time students have success when they write about their work. And my, I don't know, most, a lot of the work I do is classified, so it can't, like, that just wasn't really that open to me. And, and uh, so I, you know, like, second choice, I was like, well, maybe I can try to write about, um, you know, virtual economics and gaming and, you know, the growing, uh, the growth there. So that's, that's kind of how I settled on my topic. Uh, the, the, for the summary of the, of the three, I, I would say they're all linked just by the idea that, um, I talk about virtual things, things that happen in virtual spaces. But, you know, I try to make the point that that virtual activity has impact and meaning 
and effects in the real world. I mean, people are living there. Uh, people are earning their incomes by things that they do online and things like that. So um, it's not just contained in virtual places. It, it, there's definite spillover effects. Thank you so much for that summary. And I think this is going to be increasingly relevant over time, right? Um, so when we think about things that are on the horizon with Neuralink or with augmented reality and virtual reality, people spending even more of their time in a virtual world or hybridizing. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad to see this is catching on. From my perspective, it's just like really obviously interesting. Um, but then, you know, as you pointed out, this may just be because we have some prior bias as, as gamers growing up and so forth. Um, which even that, I think, is something that would be increasingly true over time, right? So younger audience, there's going to be more people who are digital natives. Um, and we might even say like gaming natives. Um, and plus one to Brian Kaplan. He was my advisor, um, my chair. And um, for the audience, he recently kicked off Bet On It, a sub stack. And the content has been really good. So he switched out of Econ Log, I believe it was, where he had been for years. Um, and now has a Substack. Cool. So um, I mentioned Brian Kaplan was my chair. Um, if you don't mind name dropping for a moment, um, who was the rest of your committee? Um, and um, is there anything like that you just want to call out that interests that links their interest to your own? Yes. Yeah, so when I started narrowing in on a topic, I thought, you know, there's so much I could talk about with respect to public choice uh, in virtual environments and spontaneous order um, and society uh, rule creation and adherence and reputation markets. So I really um, tried to uh, focus or concentrate on like the public choice and the Austrian faculty and kind of hit them up. Uh, what I, what I, it was so fascinating to me though because I very quickly discovered that writing about virtual environments and games um, there's not a lot of economists that are doing it at the moment. There's a few, <clears throat> but I was met with a lot of puzzlement. Like, like what, what is this? I don't understand what you're trying to do. Like, what is it you're trying to convey? How is this applicable? Like, there was skepticism that I could make the point that things that were happening online were, in fact, um, important in the real world. Uh, so so I, I asked a, a few professors, and I, I had a few turn me down, actually, on the topic. But I ended up with um, Professor Richard Wagner. He was my advisor. Um, he, I think he likes um, kind of the weird and the strange and the unusual. Because he, like, after I explained to me the whole thing, he goes, I'm, I'm really interested to see where this goes. I just want to watch you explore it. So let's do it together. Um, I, I picked up uh, Carlos Ramirez because I thought I was going to have a monetary paper. And because I was going to model tariffs and things like that. We can talk about that later if you want. But um, it was a paper you, you helped me look at, actually, and, just, and we decided that the data was not telling the story that I wanted to tell. Oh, wow. But, um, yeah, so I, I thought I was going to have him to help me with that part, and uh, Chris Coyne was the Austrian slash public choice slant. So that was my committee, those three. Excellent, excellent. Coyne is, I'm, you know, all, all great scholars, but I'm a, a very big fan of Coyne. Um, I think he tends to focus more on an Austrian perspective to conflict resolution. Um, which was too far afield of my own interests that I never bothered to have that discussion with him. But um, yeah, to the audience, check out Google Scholar, all of these scholars. Wagner, you reflect in the title um, as he is the inventor, do I dare say, if not the leader in the theory of entanglement. Um, okay, great. And one other thing that I want to call out in terms of just like broad background overarching themes kind of thing is I really appreciated, yes, how you discussed uh, like virtual economies and also your discussion on property rights, which um, is something that, it, that can apply in the real world, right? In the non-virtual world. Absolutely. And I thought there was, um, in terms of an overview, we're going to get into it, but I thought there was some really good stuff there. Uh, and then I'll just also mention, just to name drop someone who's not affiliated with our school at all, but I think has a tangential interest in the project and, uh, and maybe lend some credibility to the importance of the project is Dr. David Friedman, right? Son of Milton Friedman. Um, he's over in California. I don't know. What is it? Uh, I'll probably get which school that is wrong. But he has talked about uh, legal systems very different than ours. And he's a longtime World of Warcraft player. And uh, he has discussed that this would be an interesting topic. I think his concern was being able to obtain relevant data 
Um, so he hasn't done any work here, but in his own blogs, he's called out that this is like really cool. That was a challenge I had getting data. I can imagine. Yeah. Also putting on my software engineering hat, I wouldn't let you have that data. <laughs> so, like, right, of course. Uh, but I, I will say as we dive in, I think you were able to get some really interesting material. <clears throat> So on to the first one. So uh, in, in the first chapter, and please check the description of the video for an abbreviated abstract, like a quick summary of each of these papers. Um, with respect to the first chapter, you write on the virtual economy. And what I wanted to do here was get your broad thoughts on cryptocurrency and also the notion of the metaverse. Yeah, so as I was writing, um, you know, the pandemic happened. And so like a bunch of stuff got pushed online and like NFTs exploded, right? During the last couple of years. And so I, I got asked a lot about NFTs and uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain. And, you know, people would ask me, um, is like, is that kind of what you're working on? Like Bitcoin stuff? And I'd say, well, it's related. It's not sort of directly at the heart uh, necessarily of what I'm getting at. I mean, but it's definitely related. So, Sometimes when people ask me my opinion about NFTs, I, you know, you can't help but think about like the, um, the pump and dump schemes and the boom and the busts and there's like, you know, so the bees auctions where people are buying art for $500 million and stuff. I, I think that per personally, I think that's a flash in the pan and that is not really where the true use uh, or the utility from crypto and blockchains is going to come from. Um, also, I, 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 I kind of hate to rain on anyone's parade, but I, I'm not sure Bitcoin is getting much traction as a currency per se. Um, but I do think that blockchains are going to be phenomenally relevant when it comes to tracking property, both in real life and online. I, I think that's where the uh, economic utility is eventually going to settle. Um, there, 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 there probably will eventually be a cryptocurrency that will uh, turn into a decent um, uh, currency, but I, I, I just, Bitcoin is struggling. It's really struggling. Yeah, I think kind of going back to Econ 101, or at least Austrian 101, um, that we're treating Bitcoin more as a store of value than as a, uh, yeah. you know, a, a means of trade. And then I also think um, in my own work blogging as an undergraduate, <clears throat> when I first discovered Austrian was around 2012, 2013, when I was a very early adopter of Bitcoin. And I think the Austrian story is one of few that can actually explain the price movements of Bitcoin over time. And um, it's kind of a two-edged sword because as you point out, we know <laughs> this actually doesn't do a lot of the things that people will attribute to it. Uh, but we also know that um, it's quite useful for a number of reasons. And then I'll also just shout out a later stream today Interesting timing. I will be getting into Web3 from a development perspective for the first time in a public stream. And this will include smart contracting, which is an important distinctive feature from um, like Bitcoin using it as a story value unit of account, but being able to create smart contracts, as you point out, linking to property control um, and even governance structures, which is like, I agree with you 110%. Um, that is where the real long-term value will be. Okay, cool. Um, next question is that you gave a discussion on the growth and complexity in virtual economies. This is a two-parter. <laughs> um, so first, would you place this work in economic history? Like what genre, what subcategory of economics are we really dealing with here? Would you place it in economic history? Um, if not, where? And then second, um, would you mind discussing what is this notion of complexity? So you talk a bit about like the growth of complexity, but what do we mean by that? Yeah, so I just generally, like when I think about virtual environments and their emerging use, um, I, 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 I have to say, I mean, especially as a GMUite, uh, that it's, a, it's kind of a Hayekian story. I, I could not help but notice, you know, again and again and again as I did my research and my reading and I interviewed people online and I would observe things that, I mean, just spontaneous order, like, permeated everything. Um, the virtual uh, virtual spaces are kind of a, the frontier of mankind at the moment, you know, like, you know, it's like the Wild West, or, uh, you know, people are creating their own solutions for problems that they encounter without formal, formality um, and, and uh, structure. A lot of it's relying on reputation markets and things like that. Reputation markets, super key. 
Mm, this does again link back to David Friedman, who talked about the ability of governance structures to work um, without a top-down control. And one of the keys is reputation, right? So a book reference I would give there, feel free to add any that you have. Uh, I would give uh, The Machinery of Freedom. And then also Price Theory, David Friedman's Price Theory. Th there are a bunch of great price theory texts from other authors as well. Um, I, I like Alshin um, for that. And then Hayek, Soki. I think we're going to come back to that later. I, ho I hope we do because I have another question where if I were to answer it, I would say read Hayek. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get there though. Um, but um, maybe one book or paper from Hayek, Road to Serfdom is like hard to pass on. Um, he might have something better, but I'll go Road to Serfdom. Um, any other kind of like external to your own work, any other uh, one or two papers or books um, that you would call out? Uh, and then we can also kick that over to uh, the property rights discussion, which is going to be chapter two, if you want to do that. Um, what's the, um, the, uh, the name is like just on the edge of my, what's the Hayek essay, the use of knowledge in society? That's it. Yeah. yeah, I like when you talk about um, the difference between top down and bottom up and spontaneous order and the knowledge problem. Like, I, there's nothing that can beat it. I think that's like one of my favorite essays of all time. So, got to got to call that out. Very good, very good. Okay, great. Last paper for the first chapter, <clears throat> um, in the paper on entangled virtual economy, you reference several MMOs. So we're talking about like multiple different MMOs here, and you give concrete examples, right? So for my gamers out there. Um, this work is not yet published, but keep an eye out on Google Scholar. It will soon emerge. Um, and yeah, he talked, he gives specific um, case studies into different video games and also interesting events in the history of those video games. So I think my, I think my gamers will appreciate this at least as much as my economists do. Uh, but among these case studies, um, which would be that in-game system or reflection of economic theory that you think is most interesting or surprising? So just among all these case studies, if there was one that you would want to talk about, which would it be? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think that um, before I answer, I just want to make the, the point that um, MMOs are an easy um, example to reach for when we talk about virtual economics and trade and economies and complexity and emergence. but as um, virtual environments writ large evolve, um, all of these principles that I explore in my papers uh, will apply not just to MMOs, which are sort of self-contained um, and games, uh, but to, like, for instance, the metaverse, uh, yeah. for example, because uh, people are currently making their living in these spaces, and I think that that will, that will only increase. So. You know, just just to make the point that um, it, it's wider. Uh, this discussion is wider than just than MMOs. Um, let's see, man. I I mean, you gotta if you study virtual environments and things. I mean, you gotta mention Eve Online. You have to. It's just because uh, the game developers uh, leave so much to the players. I mean, because, you know, players will submit tickets and say, like, well, you know, uh, John defrauded me, and he lied to me, and he stole my money. And the game developers are like, ah, it's part of the game, man. you got to figure that out. Um, and, and, and Eve has so much spontaneous order. Like, I mean, you can't not mention it. You have to. Um, another MMO that I came across that really surprised me, I hope I say the name right, Europa Universalis. It uses dollars as currency. Like, actual dollars. So when you play, and it's like most uh, MMOs of virtual environments, it's against their terms of service to sell your items for money uh, because they don't want that. But in this MMO, it's explicitly allowed. And so I was very surprised to discover that that existed. And I think that will uh, only increase as time moves on. Um, there's a, like no one thinks of Roblox really, right, as a complex virtual economy um, or Minecraft, but I, I actually interviewed and uh, cited my children because they're um, such, you know, uh, prolific gamers, and they knew so much about these economies, and I would interview them, and my wife would laugh at me, and so I was like, all right, explain to me how property rights work on this server. But, um, yeah, those, and those are huge. Roblox has, like, billions of players, and it's, it's going to be a force. Uh, so th those are the ones that come to my mind. Agree, yeah, and I think the explanatory power of what you're working on, this project, and then we can loop in other people, too, but I think that will grow over time. I think you're right to point out from MMO to metaverse is a big step. And then just taking a step back for those who aren't gamers, 
why are MMOs interesting? Um, love to hear your perspective. One of my perspectives would be, if you look at the first video games, say Pong, there's not very much like human action that you can even study or predict or data that you can extract. It's not very interesting. When you get into um, role-playing games, people are able to make more choices. Those role-playing games grow in complexity. And we get to MMOs, which um, are often MMORPG. Role-playing games, people can do human-like things and interact with other people. And then as you point out, bringing in real currency, real skin in the game, now we're starting to get something that can potentially reflect to a substantial extent what people actually are like. Um, and that presents this virtual universe that's really interesting for study of human action and the potential to conduct experimentation that we would not do in the real world, like uh, um, you know, eliminating a village one day or something like that. Um, anything you want to add there or ready for chapter two? Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm good there. Cool. Okay, so chapter two, this is the one uh, where you dive into property rights. Um, and I was really impressed with this. We talk about DeSoto. Later in the paper, you talk about uh, dim sets. Um, so I guess the first question would be, so DeSoto, DeSoto just draws a distinction between dead capital and titled capital. And I take it that he's referring to a title coming from a central authority like a government. Um, so do you see this distinction as like a, a useful bright line test um, or something that pertains to a gradient? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, when I read this, I was like, wow, that's that's a good question, really, because I hadn't thought about it like this, and I may, maybe if I try to publish this paper, I should go back and talk about this, actually, but this is a good question. Um, I, I do think it's a gradient, because black and gray markets exist, and there are participants in those markets, and they don't always need a proper title, like, you know, stamped and recorded and, you know, able to be taken to a bank and leveraged again. Sometimes they just want the use of the space without some of the other stuff that comes with it. So I, I, do, I do think it's a gradient and that people participate along a spectrum of um, you know, proper or legal uh, frameworks. Awesome. Let me ask you this, and this is speculative, of course, but if you had to guess if DeSoto was on the call with us, and if I asked what if it was titled by a DAO, a Decentralized Autonomous Organization, that is a pseudo-governmental entity constructed on the basis of cryptocurrency contracts? There's a title, it's a verifiable title, but the originator is not one who has a monopoly on the use of physical force. Do you think DeSoto would recognize this as um, non-dead capital or perhaps somewhere in the middle? What do you think? So um, if, if, it's, if it's okay, can I back up one step and just sort of explain the premise of, of how DeSoto's thoughts are Please. connected to yeah. I, I just want to make sure for the listeners briefly. So um, DeSoto, he's, he's a very famous uh, economist slash politician in South America because he was making the point uh, that the uh, there are many, many ineffective uh, governments in South America. I mean, because we in the United States, we have a pretty effective government. It does a lot of things for us that we take for granted. We buy and sell things, um, and it's pretty seamless. Uh, in South America, you have to either bribe people, or sometimes there are no avenues available to people uh, to, you know, record and catalog and get their property recognized. That it might be in their family for generations. And he came up with this huge um, movement, and he, he handed out pamphlets and flyers where he was explaining, like, look, this is a keystone of a functioning, uh, of a powerful functioning first world economy is 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 title and transfer and you can leverage things to get loans and and he said you know there's you can increase the gdp of your nation by two to three times just by formally recognizing property rights um and he he had a lot of success in doing this actually he was elected um uh you know political leader and he moved around various countries anyway so the point that i'm making uh, in this paper is that you can actually take his idea and uh, apply it to the virtual world because there are, there is a uh, virtual property and virtual property like things that people treat as their property uh, in virtual worlds. And I'm, I'm making the argument that it's, it's kind of like those South American countries who don't have very effective governments. Is because if you, uh, say in a World of Warcraft game, you know, have a, an item that you treat as your property, but it's not formally recognized as your property, it's being 
maybe undervalued. And, yeah. you know, um, so anyway, I just wanted to make that point here. Um, now I forgot the question you just asked me. Um, just if you were to speculate, um, it, do you think that DeSoto would consider a title which is issued by a non-governmental organization? Oh, uh, would, would that be capital which is alive or, um, or it's not good enough? So I think it depends on uh, the, your trading partner's view of the credibility of that um, organization. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes if you want to take out a loan with a bank, that's one scenario, right? Or in another scenario, maybe you just want to sell your gun you just earned to another guy so he can use it on another server. And he just wants a, a stamp to just show that he didn't steal it or something or, or forge it. And, that, and that's probably fine for that use. So again, a spectrum that we were talking about. Um, but I think it's better you know, than nothing. Absolutely. I, I love this answer. This answer is that it depends on the perception on the part of your trade counterpart. And if that trade counterpart views the issuing institution as credible to the extent of a government or perhaps beyond the extent of a government, then it's efficacious. If there's some trust issue, then that will undermine the perceived value there. And I think that's actually like, I think that's actually a really optimal model. So I appreciate that answer. Cool. Let's get down to dim sets. So just um, kind of your, your, your broad strokes, comparison, contrast, DeSoto dim sets. And then is there any other kind of like other scholar, other idea of property rights that you want to bring in? Yeah. So the, my broad point that I was trying to make in this paper, chapter two here was just that how virtual property evolved a long time. And, you know, at first, uh, virtual property was very bundled. I mean, if you think back to, like, the Le your Legend of Zelda cartridge on your Super Nintendo uh, in, you know, 1988 or whatever, you know, that year was, you'd have to buy your virtual goods as a package, and you could convey them to someone else, but only in that manner. And then, you know, like, MMOs become a thing, which is like a leasing model. Um, and you have to agree to the terms of service. Uh, and there's gray markets, right, that, that uh, demonstrate demand for ownership of goods. Um, and since I'm here at this point, I'll take a little stop and just bring in um, Locke. Uh, oh, nice. John Locke. Um, because he had this whole model of homesteading, right? Like it's like, it's like the labor theory of property, if you will, kind of, um, that people have this view that if they put the time and the work into something, like why would they not be entitled to the gains from that, right? And that's kind of his whole, he writes a whole book and like it's pretty widely accepted in the Western world, right? That if you can maintain your property and uh, guard it, then it's yours. Um, and people transferred that view to their virtual property and, you know, it, that has evolved uh, into the blockchain. And like there's this whole network of gaming software companies who, um, are on board with uh, using blockchain technology to have items transfer between their games. Um, there are protocols being invented to transfer items between blockchains. That's pretty revolutionary, I think. Um, so, um, and I started talking again and I forgot your question again. Uh, Just a comparison, uh, compare contrast of concepts of property rights. Uh, we have DeSoto, Demsets, you brought in Locke, which was a great move because now you've connected this work to all of economics. <laughs> um, that I, I don't think you can call yourself a informed economist if you aren't familiar with some of Locke. Um, and so, are there any interesting um, holes in any of these theories, or any interesting comparative advantages in any of these theories? I'll give you one by way of example. <clears throat> as widely understood as Locke is. I, and you know, I don't want to put you on the spot to agree or disagree with me. I'm sh uh, if, if commenters uh, would like to discuss this further, I'd love to have them on. I think Locke has a number of holes in his concept of property rights. Um, and so, but I also think there's hints of truth. Um, and so the idea of homesteading, uh, I don't think that's an optimal model of property rights um, because it, when it comes to the question of trade, whose good is this? Um, I don't think homesteading gets you there. And so titling is interesting because you have the backing of like a, a government authority. And if Jim and Sarah disagree, um, there's like this really strong, we would say hegemonic um, government that it basically dominates the whole situation and gets to pick. And so that situation almost always resolves 
Um, maybe not in an optimal way, but at least it almost always resolves in a clear way. <laughs> um, so, so what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I, I actually don't take issue with anything you said. Um, I'm not necessarily like a Lockean myself. I, I just brought it in uh, to my discussion just for illustrative purposes um, because even though I don't necessarily think this is a comprehensive, you know, uh, top-down um, explanatory economic theory, um, I do think that um, people view property sometimes the way that he viewed property and they treat it sort of the way that he treated it. So, I don't know, it was like a, an argumentum ad populum, I guess, maybe. So I'm, I'm, That's great. I'm fine. I'm fine if it's not solid economically. That's fine. I appreciate that point. And this reflects something you said earlier, <clears throat> which boils down to the perception of the individual making the, act, the action or the selection. It's not so much about what is the optimal structure as simply what do we predict some person would do. And if, if Locke is popular, then many people will act along Lockean lines, even if that's not optimal. So great. It's great to hear you clarify uh, that point, too. So just to kind of summarize and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems kind of like you're drawing on, you're sort of surveying um, concepts of property rights, and you're not necessarily landing on one. You're not necessarily creating your own optimal amalgam. Uh, you're just saying, hey, there's like little bits we can learn from all of these. Yeah, that's fair. I like that. Awesome. And I, I like that too for reference of the reader as even if you're not into games, even if you're not into virtual economies, this chapter two has quite a bit of just property rights information, which I found was a, at least a great survey. Cool. So with that, chapter three. <clears throat> All right. So you begin pointing out that virtual worlds are largely self-regulating. Um, but there may be need for additional regulation. And that's kind of, uh, in my view, what this paper is largely about, is where are those edge cases? Why, what do we learn from those edge cases? Um, so you proceed to point out some of the places where virtual activity, again, you take this approach of the perception of most people. And uh, so that seems to be a really consistent approach. I like that. So you point out some places where virtual activity seems to be at odds with our social norms. Um, and maybe you could for a second address, this is just crossing my mind now, maybe you could for a second address the distinction between sort of American social norms and like global norms or something like that. Let's leave it, let's go one question at a time. So what are your thoughts there before we go to other questions? Well, I mean, so people operate within the frameworks that are available to them. Um, even in the United States, uh, people operate very differently within their very different frameworks. I mean, if you're a you know, uh, wealthy billionaire, you have a lot of, you know, legal resources available to you or government available resources available to you. But if you're in a, uh, in a poor neighborhood, maybe uh, the police are not a proper recourse if you have a dispute with your neighbor because um, maybe you're in the country uh, in, in a way that's not quite legal or clear and you don't want to interact with uh, government authority figures. So, I mean, people just behave in ways that respond, yeah, to the frameworks that they find themselves in. That's very Beckerian theory, right? Like, just reduce someone down to um, uh, an economic unit that has no preferences. They just sort of move in the directions that the system they live in push them. Um, and, you know, that's not entirely accurate, but it's a good model for thought space, right? But, um, yeah, and, and as you said, uh, people in different parts of the world or different countries have very different incentive structures or, you know, dispute resolution available to them. So certainly when people find themselves in different virtual environments, that will be true. And the virtual environments themselves operate in different legal frameworks. So social norms from where you live in real life uh, can, can vary pretty widely when you log on somewhere. I think it's a great point, and you highlight that it's um, sort of goes together with Becker's work, and I agree with this. I think the entire approach of let's look at people's perceptions is very Chicago, um, and I love it, and I think there's an affinity between the Austrian school and the Chicago school here. I would also say this sort of analysis along lines of ecological rationality, right? Your rationality is subject to various constraints, norms, and so forth is extremely Austrian, and it's very Vernon Smith, so it's very GMU. <laughs> Um, 
those are some great harmonies to call out. On reflection of the question about, um, let's say, some hypothetical accusation of uh, American bias, um, we can move on to particular cases. And uh, the first thing I would say is I pretty much can't think of any specific cases in your work where this would be a useful uh, criticism, with one exception, and it happened to be one of the exceptions that I think is interesting anyway, and that is the case of child labor. Um, so <clears throat> this is one of those cases where you say, and I think rightly so, hey, normally, particularly from an American perspective, child labor is not okay, right? Um, and we can trace back the laws, and this goes to, I think, like the early 1900s, largely with factory work. Um, and there was important physical dangers and dangers for abuse, uh, certainly in that context. Today, um, do our virtual uh, economies like similar, um, or are they importantly different? Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, so, so you're you're asking, should should we have a visceral reaction to online child labor? Is that? Is that I guess there's two interesting questions here. So one, we can ask that. Uh, maybe we can just ask the straightforward question, should we carve out an exception? Like we have exceptions for child actors. Maybe there's an exception for, you know, kids who play video games at home but make money from it somehow. Or farm, farm workers, right? I think they're accepted. Yeah, although that one is pretty controversial, I think, right? Because uh, although the exception exists, they are still subject to, like, physical stress. Um, so, so that's the first question. Let me just enunciate the second question, which is, given your approach of following people's perceptions, maybe the more accurate question in line with your methodology would be to ask, how have perceptions changed? Or are, is the average American perceiving uh, these things differently? Or do they sort of say, these things are the same, it's child labor is child labor? Yeah, I, I, I do agree with the, with the, I think the broad point that you're making that, you know, a child laborer, uh, you know, in like the coal mines of South Carolina in the 1800s would look very different from a potential, you know, 2028 child laborer, you know, uh, making, writing code for a Roblox game. Uh, th those two things look very different. Uh, that's a very uh, Walter Williams point, I think, because, you know, he would talk about, you know, like, sh we should be a little more careful about our visceral reaction because today, Kids work in air-conditioned spaces with, you know, a lot of comforts that are not, you know, ha inherently hazardous to their health, um, and it might benefit them too. It gives them a work ethic, and it, it, it uh, improves their human capital if they're learning how to code and stuff. Yeah. Part part of the um, angle I was taking in this paper, as as you keep pointing out, is perception, and it was kind of a public choice story because part of the point that I was making was that. Um, I think special interest groups at some point are going to notice some of these things that are going on online yep. that I was pointing out, like child labor and there's lots of online sex work and yep. uh, there's like online slavery, that's like super weird, right? Like how can you force someone virtually to do something they might not want to do? That's kind of a funny situation, but um, I think in the world of like, I don't know, like Pizzagate and QAnon and like people who feel very deeply about, I don't know, issues surrounding children and sexuality and, you know, like, I, I just, I cannot help but think that as human activity in virtual environments increases in both number and complexity, that at some point special interest groups are going to, like, take notice of some of these issues. Absolutely. And, and demand that real world governments uh, do something. Because right now, as you pointed out, uh, these virtual environments are mostly privately um, um, moderated or enforced by, the, by their software companies and somewhat internally by their users. But Absolutely agree. Yeah. Okay, so that's a great response. So there's the public choice story here. Maybe we take a quick step back. Um, what do we mean by public choice? And um, we've talked about special interests, which I think uh, a non-economist would certainly say, yes, special interests exist, um, but to the economist and to the public choice scholar, we have a particular concept of special interests that we're thinking about here. Um, so, yeah, do you want to give kind of like your, do you, do you have like a elevator concept of public choice? What do we mean by that? What is public choice? 
Yeah, so I, I feel as a, as a GMU economist, like you have to, yes. <laughs> you have to have an elevator speed for public choice because it's where it was born. It was born yep. at GMU. Um, uh, Buchanan and Tulloch, uh, it's, it's the application of economics to politics, basically. Yeah. Yeah, great. And then special interest here would be um, ordinarily we have all sorts of interests. And then in economic terms, we generally measure these along dollar values. And the public choice school notices that some special interests um, engage political activity. And so often these special interests will economize by gathering distributed costs and concentrating them into a single organization that can sort of charge everyone a dollar and aggregate a billion dollars and you know, pay off John McCain or whatever it might be, engage in lobbying more or less. And this connects to a story about regulatory capture. And so the idea here, I don't want to put words in your mouth, please correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea here would be that these virtual laws um, are going to emerge for the same reason ordinary laws emerge, that um, there are special interests, um, and so there are going to be organizations that are going to ultimately try to lobby for regulation of the virtual space. It, yeah, yeah, it's... it's, 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 it's pretty much what you said. It's a, it's a political group that can gain notoriety or power or money by attaching themselves uh, to a, a particular issue of interest and gaining followers and, you know, grabbing their attention and their passion. Yeah. So part of the, um, part of my technologist side, maybe the more naive side, um, hopes that technology can enable um, like sort of like deregulation or robustness against certain kinds of regulation. Um, GMU Mercatus Center, um, was it Brito? I'm, I may be getting the scholar's wrong name, who wrote uh, like permissionless innovation. Um, and then I think David Friedman has talked about the possibility, and it may be his son who's very much involved in seasteading, um, the possibility of crypto anarchy that we may live in a physically regulated world, but we can go online and leverage cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency governance to um, have competitive governance. And we can sort of more easily pick the set of laws that we want to adhere to. So um, if you have anything to add there, uh, feel free. Otherwise, it's just a note for the audience that um, this is the tension that I'm interested in is there is the traditional public choice story. This is how laws have been made and it's going to impact virtual worlds. I think there's this interesting other possibility that we want to keep an eye on. Maybe it's a little bit different. So that would be a call out there. Anything else before we go to, oh, that was the final chapter. Yeah, anything else before we go to closing? Um, I just in, in, that, in that last chapter, I do do a very brief um, discussion of why I think, why even though um, I feel as virtual environments increase uh, in their usage and complexity for real world economic activity and the demand for legislation will increase along with it, that it's going to be difficult and weird and hard to do that um, because there's so many different types of governance structures that different yeah. virtual environments have adopted. And like you said, uh, a lot of those um, are very resistant to management or outside c control or influence. So I don't know, uh, back to the spontaneous order thing, it's going to be interesting to just, you know, observe the next 20 years and see how these uh, environments I interact and, and emerge. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, um, you know, here I'd ask about any closing remarks. Um, I would also just get your thoughts, like, um, now that you've got this doctorate in, in, in economics, yes, it's some focused niche, but sort of what are your general thoughts on the national and international economy? Um, any interesting ways that your work connects there, or even if your work doesn't connect, things you've learned in passing, um, that uh, let's say as a policymaker or as a business person, what would be the moves to make in the coming months? Oh man, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you uh, get the same questions I do everywhere I go. People want to talk about inflation, uh, and um, it, it may be a byproduct of my dissertation topic, but people ask me a lot about Bitcoin a lot, and cryptocurrency. Um, sometimes I get asked for stock tips. Do people ask for stock tips? Yes, yes. So um, certainly, um, I, haven't, I haven't presented at a conference since the Southern Economic Association. When was that? September or October? So been like 
five months or something like that. So to prepare for today's stream, I simply stared at a chart of the year to date S&P 500 performance, because as we know, that's all an economy really is. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Um, I, I, my, my paper that didn't work out, I wanted to, it was going to model tariffs, um, you know, as uh, the, the World of Warcraft um, company of uh, Blizzard changed the way that money could enter and leave the way their economy. Hmm. Uh, so I don't know, I, I have an interest in tariffs and trade and things like that. Um, yeah, I, nothing, uh, you know, more, more super specific than that, I guess. So just, you know, general. So keep an eye out for inflation, pretty much where, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. Yep. Okay, um, you know, I asked you this, like, before, we, when we were creating the description for the video, so I don't believe you have a website or anything like that. Uh, do you have any notion about when the um, papers might be published? Like, someone could go Google it and find it at that time? Oh, so uh, next Friday, May 6th, is the deadline for everyone to submit their final dissertation uh, work, and I think they're going to publish it in the Mars database within a week of that. So probably mid March it'll be awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, this was great, uh, John. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, I I really appreciate being on, and thanks for you know the the discussion.